On this week's show, very disappointing weekend for the Irish provinces in Europe, unless you're a Leinster fan, of course. Fortunately, we come up with some potential long-term solutions for Irish rugby. You're welcome. We will also pick our best crack 15 that we ever played with. Except at fullback, where no one is any crack. <laughs> Joe presents Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby, together with Guinness. Hello and you're very welcome to Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby here on Joe, together with Guinness. No Trimby this week. Where is Trimby, Baz? <laughs> have to ask you that. He's lost in France. Um, I think he's away with work, I think. Yeah. Where are you, Trimby? Kairos. Uh, he was in France for Ulster versus Claremont. It's just me and Jerry Flannery on the couch this don't, weekend. Don't sound disappointed. I am very excited. Um, we can just enjoy our disappointment that Munster are oh, potentially just wallow. wallow. Wallow for a while. Uh, yeah, the only correspondence I had with Trimby over the weekend was uh, he texted me wondering that if someone knocks on a ball, right, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's dribbling along the ground and you just come along and you volley it, or are you half volley it and it goes over the post? Is that considered a acceptable drop goal? No, I don't think so, no. Why not? Because you don't have to be in possession of the ball first. Oh. You you never take possess you've never taken possession of the ball. Right. You've so just you can't hacked just, it. You can't just hack the ball over the, the bar like a <laughs> I don't think so, no. Now to me. There, there you, you go. go. There That's you go. Answer to your question. <laughs> Uh, glad to see you were very well, What did you say to him? Uh, whoever asked him the question said, said, say this to Baz, but uh, I don't expect Are him. you deemed to be the, the cleverer of, <laughs> no, of the two of I, you? No, I thought so. <laughs> Half, halfway through it, I thought so. And then, he, then your man finished it by going, but I don't think he has a clue what he's talking about anyway. Oh, okay. So I was okay. like, feck that guy, uh, which I, I actually don't, <laughs> I don't know. So. Uh, but other than that, uh, how's your weekend been? Weekend was a lot of rugby. Uh, yesterday was disappointing. I was everything was building towards the Munster game, mm. um, and I thought that they would. I thought that they could get a result there, but I think the the gulf is just widening now with teams that have more money and more quality. Then, mm. and that was apparent. You could see that across pretty much, apart from the Munster game, you could see it across the three games that. The other lads, the other teams played in. Yeah, I mean, like 72nd minute, they're still winning. Um, they obviously started very strong, uh, getting nine points up and uh, probably did a lot more better than people imagined they'd do. A lot more better than a people. A lot more better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Munchens, <laughs> you taught us so well. Man, I, thought, I thought Munster's effort, all of the things that, you, that they needed to have, their, their effort, their work rate, all of those things were there. Just the the there's just a gulf in there was just the Racing just had better quality that mm. was unfortunate, and and you could see that that there was the same I could say the same for the Claremont game, Claremont and Ulster like Ulster were unbelievably competitive, in all the things that like the players can bring to the table in terms of like how hard they work, um you know how they commit themselves to to contact mm -hmm. I I think that both sides but are after oh, when you when you spread it across eighty minutes. It was like Munster were containing Racing. Mm. I don't think, like, if you look at the opportunities Munster had of scoring a try, like the Conway one, Munster didn't create for that. That was just Conway just made a great read. He didn't really have an option. He had to go for it. It was yeah. either, either that or a try for them. And then the other time then was, I suppose, when they, when they went to the corner, did the peel around with CJ off the mall, and then Chris Farrell, Vakatawa, like, very few people would be able to stop Chris Farrell from there. But yeah, that was they didn't create a huge amount. They contained Racing a lot, but I felt like in, in the last, the, 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 particularly the last quarter of the game, I felt like Racing just started picking them off, like the fatigue of trying to deal with, with, with those kind of big men, those ball carriers, and saw the same in the Claremont-Ulster game. Um, I, I'm not picking out the, the Connacht-Toulouse game at the moment because I think that that was, Connacht and Toulouse was more general, you know what I mean? I felt like, the, I felt like Munster and Ulster both were right in the mix for a long time against against mm. Claremont and Racing, but I felt like fatigue and the strength of the bench that that the the French sides were able to bring on, were that that ultimately paid paid its price. And if you look at like Finn Russell, how accurate Racing were with their handling at times, it was phenomenal. Like they were ever, I think, Vakatawa was was was. It's like having a, a back row forward running at full pelt in the middle of the field and you have Finn Russell just picking off holes and 
Fakatawa, I think he, he did he have eight defenders, but three of Fakatawa had 16 carries. And Munster, like Munster, had eleven missed tackles between Rory Scanlon and Chris Farrell. On oh, Fakatawa. Not, not, yeah. not. I'm not sure on him, but okay. just they had eleven missed tackles between them through yeah. the centre of the field. So like, and I thought as the game went on, I felt that Munster were starting to soak a lot more. You know, you can see the fatigue coming in. Same as Ulster game, you see that they bring on bigger forwards, fresher forwards, and uh, the ball carriers like Munster. I, I thought Munster's bench didn't have a big impact. Mm. Um, I felt that they soaked quite a lot when they came on and then it just gives them more front football and gives Finn Russell Finn Russell doesn't need a lot of time to pick out holes in your in your defence and uh, that was unfortunate but I thought like I thought there was Munster like CJ had a big big work rate I thought Pete worked his ass off you know they they all tried but the accuracy wasn't there accuracy wasn't there in handling and um, that's ultimately yeah. it yeah if um, so what would you change uh, performance-wise for Munster? What would um, what could they have done more to to uh, threaten the line? Um, did they did they go in with I mean did they go in with the right attitude? Did they go in with the right game plan? Their attitude is a hundred percent, man. Sorry, was, I mean game plan. Did they did they go in with the right? Well, like I'm not I'm not I'm, I don't sit in the coaches' meetings, so I don't know exactly what they were going out to do. Mm. Um, I felt. I felt like their handling was was not was not. I I felt it wasn't sharp against Ulster and it wasn't sharp here either. Mm. Um, it there there was no real handling in the in the Leinster game. The conditions were poor in that game, but this was indoors. And when I saw how hard when Munster were in possession, when I saw how hard that uh, that Rastin were going at the Munster breakdown all the time, they were committing bodies to it. You mm. know, re, so if they're committing. If they're committing really hard to trying to steal the ball, there's got to be space elsewhere. And I thought when 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 they did get the ball, if they got the ball to width, there'd be a bit more space there, and they'd be also moving the ball a little bit more, making the the racing pack. Particularly when the likes of Tammy Afuna are on the field, you want to move them around and shift them, and then try to isolate them. But it, it didn't materialise. Yeah, um, the Teddy, Teddy Thomas try. Um, I suppose first of all, what an unbelievable piece of skill. I think the camera angles and all that kind of crack we'll, we'll get to in a second. But when it happened, uh, I thought Russell, I was there, what is he doing with this kick? And then when I when he executed, I was like, oh, nice one, he's butchered that. Mm. And then Thomas got to it and then he's celebrating. I'm like, you didn't score that. Where you, you Where you go, <laughs> Teddy Thomas, you didn't score <laughs> that. And then they show it. And like, not only does he get the ball down, but he keeps his feet in play mm. uh, at full belt. Like, if you gave me that 100 times and said, Barry, this is going to happen, uh, you you got to do this, like, see if you can do it. I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't execute it once. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, but he, I mean, what a finish. Like Honestly, I think I'd say three, four years ago when I first saw him play, I thought he was a little bit windy. And uh, our analyst at Munster, George Murray, did, did, did a great piece of analysis on him before we played them. Um, over in France in the semi-final a couple of years ago and he just said watch how we always he's always looking to step off his wing every single time he's looking to get the ball he's not looking to take him the outside he wants to step in and um, is it, did he mean that in a negative way? no no he just, he's just saying that this is, this is what he does right. so expect it because he did it last week again. he thought he was going to do it because I know he does that a lot mm. he came up against Raqqa last weekend for Claremont mm. and he made a dick of Raqqa for, for the whole game and uh, you thought he was going to do that, and Racky thought he was going to do it as well. But then the last second, he just pops on the outside and s s burns him and scores in the corner. I, I, I thought he was kind of a one-trick pony man from, yeah. from those couple of years ago, and he was he was unbelievable that day against us. And every and when we, when we played him since, and every time I've watched him, he's just gotten better and better and better. I think he's quality. He's he's absolute quality. Like the 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 difference when you've got someone like Finn Russell, like he had so little. Like he, I know he had an advantage. For the, mm. for the try, so he could he could he could go for that kick, True. but he'd so little space and he'd so little time to get that kick away. Yet he still got the kick away. And do you remember um, in the first half, he took the ball down the short side, Finn Russell, mm. and he just out of nowhere just did this little grubber. And Mike Haley actually had to kick it. Yeah, he had to kick it over the line. Yeah. And I was trying to work. I was it was so unorthodox because what what would I think when I was looking at the angles that, that Teddy Tama had to chase and I was there, how would he finish this? He would have had to so almost kick the ball himself and bring it back in field. But it's like, 
that's what makes Finn Russell so hard to defend because he's so unpredictable. And then when you've got Shivansi and Vakatawa outside him, like if something's not coming off, you can just go Shivansi carry that yes. or Vakatawa. And then if they've got front football, he can have Shivansi running a hard line and Vakatawa outside him. Like it's very, very hard to defend. Yeah. So when they got, as they started to get front foot, as they started, when Munster started soaking a little bit in collisions, I felt Racing started really coming into it. Mm. But yeah, it's... That, it, that try... Uh, how they didn't have camera angles for to show whether he was onside. Now, when I slowed it down, like to the, you could see his head entering the screen. Um, it did. I did feel like he was onside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how they didn't have a, a, like Mark Robson tweeted last night saying in his 22 years of experience, Fred, the French uh, TV broadcasters will always be like, what, what, what TV angle? Yeah, <laughs> what TV angle? I don't know any TV angle. There's a, there's a towel over that, <laughs> over that camera there. Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah. There's nothing, nothing. Um, and there was an, another camera. So whatever about the offside line, how they didn't have a camera angle, that was beyond me. But there's a camera behind the goals, uh, right in the corner, facing up the pitch, which would have definitely shown whether he touched the town on the line or not. And mm. they didn't have that angle either. Um, when when you review games, do you have, would you have had all access to all those camera angles? You generally, you generally get four angles. George, right. would, George Murray, the analyst, would, have, would, would be able to stack four angles, which gives you a way better picture. Mm. But sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get them. Right. Um, but George would generally be able to pull four, four angles together from the broadcasters. But... Yeah, it was a big moment. Uh, it was, it was, it was massive. It was massive. I thought, I thought Conway, the Conway moment was was one of the biggest because Racing were really starting to come into it, and I was like, oh shit, like Racing are getting, they're looking really, really dominant. Their handling is crisp. They're picking off holes. They're getting momentum every time they carry the ball, and then Conway was like, that was that's a yeah, it's it's a fourteen point swing, you know. Yeah. He, they would have scored. We Munster ended up scoring, coming in just before half time as well, and I just think that. It just didn't work out. It wasn't on yeah. Munster on the day, unfortunately. Uh, the pressure is off them now, right? They, they like. When was the last time we haven't qualified for a quarterfinal? I know permutations wise, we'll go through them in a minute. It's still possible. When was the last time we didn't qualify for a quarterfinal? Four, four or five years ago. Five years. It? Um, like this squad has, they've all, they've always been under pressure. You know, it's like every season there are huge moments and. You feel like they're, st they're stretched a lot. Um, look, we went through the Leinster's strength and depth uh, last week and talked about how many options they have if they lose players across the field. They've got mm. almost three in each position that could potentially play for Ireland at this point. Uh, Munster's strength and depth, and, and you could see it yesterday when, when you know, with the bench maybe not being as strong. Um, if you go through it, you know, I know we've a Land Delande coming next year and Snayman coming, but um, where else do you think they need to? bulk up um, uh, I think there's, there's there's quality in the squad it's getting game time into them it's getting the likes of Shane Daly Craig Casey getting them to play regularly getting Jack O'Sullivan to play regularly um, it's easier when when you're winning you know what I mean like the I think are they two from eight now mm. so that, that if you put, if Craig Casey starts the game against Ospreys like there's going to be a bit of pressure on Craig now you know what I mean like maybe maybe I understand what you're saying that that you say the pressure's off now, but the pressure's always on when you're a monster. Like we got the like la we got the semi finals the last three years, and people were like were pretty irritated that we didn't get further than that. Mm. And I was like, well, like what is what is the standard that wins you European Cup? It's it's generally eight to nine international starters. Mm -hmm. That's generally it, and Munster are, are, aren't near that. Munster are probably at half that level. Like Kilcoyne isn't, um, Scannell hasn't been, Archer hasn't been, Holland hasn't been, Klein hasn't been, Pete and CJ, Murray and, and Earlsey. So Munster have four, and if the standard is eight to nine, Munster aren't getting at that standard. So they need, they need the likes of Jean Klein to go and take James Ryan's place. They need Rory Scannell to be able to, if Rory Scannell is going to, if Munster are going to get to that standard, Rory Scannell needs to nudge Robbie Henshaw out of the Irish team. Mm. Stephen Archer needs to take Tyg Furlong's place. That, that they're the kind of they're the kind of things. Or John Ryan needs to take Tyg Furlong's place. Um, and I think you can see the gap closing in certain places. You can see Kilcoyne closing on Healy by virtue of Rory Best stepping out. Scandal is closer to starting for Ireland now, but he's probably going to feel a bit of heat from other lads. But I'd say he's in pole position. 
Um, Farrell is, you know, he's up against Ringrose, who's in incredible form. But that's the standard that's required to win. And if the Munster players are playing better than the Leinster players all the time, they'll be a better team. They'll have a better chance of winning. And I, I, I think that, you know, they need to strengthen the squad. And to be fair to them, they have very few non-Irish qualified players within the squad at the moment. So signing Delende and signing Snyman is, is a good move and they need them. Mm. Um, and then hopefully that they can... Yeah. And I understand people saying, like, Yo Johan has come out and said, like, give us more time, give us more time. The reality is you don't get more time in yeah. Munster. You just, you just don't get it. Now, if, if you were in his shoes, he's saying, well, I've, I got Graham Rowntree in uh, as my scrum coach. I got him in just after the World Cup. Stephen Larkin came in and started late as well. So they, they should have consistency in their game plan from the point of view that they have 50% of the coaching ticket was there. But it's still, you know, it's still a big ask to, to, to try and get everything put together you know, in, in a short space of time when you consider when they would have got their top players back from the World Cup. But that's the reality of Munster is that like when, like we, I, I look at it like in, we were like playing Exeter, we had to beat Exeter at home to win last year. And we had the same thing where we lost to Ulster away and it was like, oh my God, Munster are going terribly. And then we backed it up by losing to Cast away, which we should never have lost. But, you know, then, then we had the same feeling coming yeah, into sure. Exeter at home. And if, if X, Billy Holland steals a line out towards the very end of the game, makes an unbelievable read, steals a line out. If he doesn't steal that ball, Exeter probably score and we don't go through in Europe. It, the margins are that fine. Yeah. And when you're, a, when you're a coach, you're aware of that. And you're aware that like getting to European semi-finals is, is difficult to do. And the fact that Munster did it consistently for three years doesn't mean that, well, the next year they're going to get to the final. Yeah. And, well, and like, I mean, you even take the, the group they're in like eight of the eight of the quarter finalists last year seven of them were in the competition this year mm. three of them are in the same group um, yeah. which is crazy when you think about it but that's the, the pressure they're under so um, to come out of this group is always going to be a massive challenge to and to have pushed it and this look we'll go to the permutations now I think because uh, we can still qualify that's the other side of it if if Saracens lose um we need Saracens to lose. We need to win with a bonus point ourselves against Ospreys. Mm. We need Sale to beat Glasgow. So Glasgow away to Sale. We need Gloucester to lose. To, to lose to, to lose. And we need uh, <laughs> Northampton to lose, lose to Leon. Leon yeah. All three of those are away. Mm -hmm. uh, so very good up, good chance they'll lose. But it's weather racing goal to Saracens and play a strong team and can beat Saracens. The Saracens have treated the competition as a second string. Mm. Like, they haven't gone full strength. Like, when I saw the team that they put out against Worcester in the league yeah. and then the following week what they put out against Ospreys, yeah. they're, they've, it's, not been, it's not been the Saracens that you... But I think if you, if from, this, from the get-go at this, in, in November when this happened, I was like, okay, what Saracens need to do here is get through those Ospreys games with weaker teams Mm. beat Munster at home with a stronger team and then beat Racing at home with a strong team. So they've done all of the above and now they, they will probably put out a stronger team just to make sure they qualify um, because the only way they can qualify for the Champions Cup next year is by to winning win it. it. Yeah. Um, that is, it's, a, it's, it's crazy, man. Like If Munster put their second string team out against Racing against Ospreys and against Ospre and against Saracens mm. like we wouldn't be anywhere near like that's this that's like I said the thing comes down to money and depth yeah you look at the you look at the the depth that that Claremont have the bench they can have the bench that that Toulouse had against Connacht they were able to bring on Rory Arnold Malvac at a hooker who a lot of people wouldn't know but I watched him play 20s for France and he's he's a magician he's unbelievably powerful Bezzy Entomac you know, and Huge, mm -hmm. like that's that's what they had on their bench. That's what Toulouse had on their bench. You look at the the bench that Racing, like the, the the players that Racing have, and then the bench that Racing have, and uh, the fact that Donica Ryan was missing as well was massive. The fact they were missing Zebo. Yeah. What like the thing is for so many things have to go right for the Irish teams. For when I say I'm talking specifically about say Munster and about Ulster at the moment and, and Connacht. Yeah. Because Leinster are just are on a different level. 
they're mm-hmm. literally on a different level. Even when I watch Exeter, when I watch Saracens, Leinster, the way they're playing is just so much better. Yeah. They, I've, I've well, let's move on to that one. The, the 42-14 uh, against, uh, it wasn't Connacht, Pat. It was Leon. Leon. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? Um, their, their starts are unbelievable. Mm. In, in, in 10 of the last 14 games, they've scored a try in the opening 10 minutes. Three of those games, they scored two tries in the opening 10 minutes. Uh, Max Deegan, again, another excellent game. Uh, two, two line breaks uh, Lens, for Leinster's bonus, tri- bonus point try. 21 carries for 71 uh, metres. Uh, Dave Kearney having an unbelievable season, surely mm. back in the, in the line for, for an Irish start. Uh, yeah, like they're, they're, they're just unstoppable at the moment. Yeah, and, and, and Leon put it to them for a while, you know, Leon put it to them. But it was like, it was the reverse. It was like, what, even when it was close, you're like, Leinster are handling this. They're not, it's not perfect. And then Leinster just pulled away as the game went on. Mm. And again, like Deegan was class. Uh, I think he 21 carries. Uh, Ruddock, again, another big game. 19 carries, four tackles. And then you have between, like, contrast, contrast the Munster game. Like, the Munster centres, like, Henshaw had 12 carries, eight defenders beaten. Ringrose had 16 carries, eight defenders beaten. You know, they, like, they, they, there's the quality that, that's required to win a European Cup. Mm. You know, like, it, when I you have th- those kind of players. I felt when, uh, like, again, with Leinster, their ball is so quick mm. but, and they're... they're Prerogative seems to be get the ball out, just quick ball, quick ball. And McGrath, when he gets the ball in his hands, there's always an option. Mm. Uh, and then whoever is first receiver has three options. Um, and you, M- Munster, I know you were saying uh, Racing put a huge amount of pressure on the breakdown, which they did. And Munster handled it quite well for a lot yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, Munster's clean outs were decent. Yeah, and Murray was getting quick ball and uh, He's his pass was way longer than it, that has been. He was he was whipping big 10, 12 yard passes to JJ, and uh, I thought he was really quick on the ball. But there didn't seem to be always an option for him. You know what I mean? Mm. There was a lot of the time there was players in the way coming. They were still retreating from maybe uh, presenting for the the previous rock. Um, it didn't seem like JJ may have had two or three players outside him demanding the ball. Uh, so. It was. Is that? Do you think is that a is that a factor for Munster that maybe there's there's not that confidence that it's like give us the ball, whereas Leinster is just such a habit now where it's like. I I don't know is the answer. I don't know like because again I'm not privy. I don't know exactly what Munster's game plan is. Mm. I, it doesn't seem to have changed dramatically mm. uh, in terms of when I just look statistically at where Munster were last year to this year in terms of kicking the ball and you can see that they still operate off a strong set piece base. And you know, knowing knowing the way that Johan likes to coach, I know he's big on on mauling, um, and and the aerial game as well is big for him. But Leinster's game is just really, really simple. It's just so simple, and they just do the basics incredibly well. But the the Le- Leinster handling is sharp, mm. you know, and I felt that that's somewhere where they're quite a bit ahead of the other provinces. Um, I think Ulster, Ulster have improved an awful lot. Their handling is, is is slick, but you just saw the momentum bleeds when when John Klein or, or or Scannell would throw. You know when there was a poor pass, a poor sweep pass, it just mm. kills momentum, which is so hard to generate against against a side away from home. So, so Leinster churned out players, and it's it, like, do you feel it's they're coming into the setup out of school with those skills uh, far more than? Potentially other provinces. I, I don't. I don't know across the board, but I know that we, we I would we would attract Jordan Lamore, would attract attra- Andrew Porter coming straight out of school, and they would have been like the difference. I suppose Jordan Lamore is physically he was as strong, he was as fast as any player in a Munster senior setup when he was in Andrews, and Andrew Porter. Anyone doesn't take a ninja to figure out that this guy is physically ready to play senior rugby. Maybe not. Maybe has a bit, a good bit to go in terms of his football skills, in terms of his rugby nose. But you know, most props come out, and if if a guy's a really good footballer at eighteen, nineteen, he's still got a bit to go to try and get physically as as strong as the guys he's going to compete with for his fundamentals of scrummaging and and just contact. But Porter was ready to go, so 
if you consider those two, like those guys came out and well, like they, they had like when a couple of years ago they had James Ryan, they had Joey Carberry, um, like Porter, Lamore, like graduating from their academy as f you know they're full internationals, like mm. you know they don't even do a full a full academy cycle, they're full internationals. Where sometimes you're wondering which guy here is going to be a Pro 14 player for us, who's here is going to be you know a European Cup player, who here could go on and play Test rugby for Ireland. Mm. But when they're graduating straight out, when they're like they're being they're bypassing the three year academy cycle and they're they're internationals already, mm. gives you an idea of. It seems to have been professionally coached in school. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's that's the key. That yeah. seems to be that seems to be it, doesn't it? Do the other teams have that uh, re the resources to be able to to put that money into schools? Um, you say the other provinces. Sorry, yeah. Oh, well, obviously not. You mm. would say like, uh, well, we just I can only I can only work off munchins and stuff like that. Like the clubs that the schools that I know, I know that like if you can if a club up in Leinster in Cl or a school in Leinster or, or you know if Clongos or Michaels can afford to have a full-time coaches in there then that's someone's full-time job that's all they're responsible for so they're going out and you know if if you know they're going to be constantly looking to upskill themselves as coaches and stay relevant to the game and as the game the game moves so quickly that they can go in and do a CPD day where they go in and see shadow the Leinster coaches for a day or Leinster will come out and, and upskill those guys and then they're in charge of making sure that the rugby programme in that school is top class and about looking after the players, you know, looking after them to make sure that the players are, are getting better. Um, whereas if you're a teacher and your main job is to teach the lads maths and geography, mm -hmm. well, that's your main job. No one's going to come in and say, geez, man, half your class failed geography. They don't know where mm. Loch Derg is. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, but have you seen them clean a breakdown? Have you? They are unbelievable. <laughs> so if you're volunteering and you're, it's, it's always just, it's, it's an additional thing you do. So I think, I don't think the, the schools that aren't private schools in, in, in Limerick or in Cork or in Galway or wherever, I don't think that they're going to have the money to put in a full-time director of rugby. But I thought what Bandon Grammar did a few years ago um, was really, really sharp, where Bandon Grammar School came together with Bandon RFC and they, they came together, they, put their, they pu pooled their money and they brought over Regis Son. The, uh, he, he was a coach, with, I think, with Toulouse. And he became the full-time director of rugby across the school and the club. So then he's like, he's upskilling all the volunteer coaches and they have one person who's, account who's accountable for it. And that school, man, like has produced so, like for a tiny school that rugby was not a tr big traditional sport, has produced like the likes of Darren Sweetenham, you know, you know, Gavin Coombe, you've got the Coombeses, you know, th these kind of lads, um, you've got French coming out of there as well. Like it's, it shows that that's like a little, I don't know if you want to say it, like a little experiment there down in Munster that yeah. that worked. So, so like, how do you do is, yeah, I, I don't know. The do, big schools. I do, mean. do Shannon, do, do Shannon, do they say we're going to have, we're going to work together with Arts Gilreach? Do Castlereagh College say we're going to be, we're going to work with UL Bohemians? With UL Bohemians yeah. or something like that? Or but why, why, surely Munster, are, they're the ones that are going to benefit from this. So where's uh, Munster's view on the whole thing? I mean, when I talk Munster, I, I'm not talking about some overlord here. I don't know who I'm, because it's not you. I think, I think it's a CEO, not an <laughs> overlord. Yeah, <laughs> but like I'm, I'm, I'm sure his being a new CEO, his main worry is the the the, the team. You know, when, when anyone when anyone criticizes Munster as a whole, I, I don't really know where the finger has been pointed. But like that is the biggest hole in the whole thing for me at the moment. It's like where, let's say over the last ten years, Munster have. We're saying Munster. So, we're, sa we're saying Munster, but you could apply this to Connacht and Ulster. Yeah, exactly. As well. Sorry. Yeah. So you've got so many players that have come out of Munster over the last ten years, um, like myself, like Niall Ronan, uh, Ian Dowling, uh, Barry O'Mahony, Ronan. Are you badly, are you badly name dropping? Again? Yes, <laughs> but, but like a lot of uh, Dennis Leamy, all these players that have come out of Munster, uh, still hovering around the game that could have easily been picked up and put into a, a team like Munchens, PBC, mm. Christians, um, as professional coaches. These guys are bursting with information and knowledge about the game. And there doesn't seem to be any uh, filter for these players to go into coaching or um, to use their knowledge to give it to young lads. I mean, I went straight out as professional went to, and coached Castroy College 
kind of off my own back working with UL Bohemians, but there was no structure to it. There was no, there was no one in Munster uh, had any interest. And this is a team who'd won the Senior Cup uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And now the game is completely gone from the school. Uh, Art School Reach, the same. The rugby is gone from the school. So when Munster are, are looking at their, the youth coming up, where, where is their control over it? Or, or where is the, the focus or the effort? I, I, I don't work with Munster men, so yeah. I, I don't know. But like what, what you're making it very Munster based. Yeah. There, if you look at this and the upside of this, the upside of this is that by focusing on improving the school and the underage pathway towards the academy, you've seen how well it works in Leinster. Now, mm. it's probably in Leinster, it's done pr predominantly through the school system. But you don't want to just be focused only on the schools. But if you were to start somewhere, if... And it's not just Munster. It's the same in Connacht. It's the same in Ulster as well. It's just that Leinster are doing it so well. And by focusing on this, by focusing on developing the pathway from when you pick up rugby ball to when you get to the Leinster Academy at 18 years of age, you can see how good their, the product is. Like Leinster, are, to me, are the best team in Europe now at the moment, mm. currently. So, and it's not just on Munster. It's not on the Munster CEO or the, or the Ulster. It's, it's probably something that has to come with the RFU with an initiative where I agree with you. I look at someone like Billy Holland and Billy is like, is a guy who is just, uh, he has so much IP built up in, in rugby. He's just, you know, he's, he consumes it nonstop. You know, he's, he's an unbelievable work ethic. Billy should be, they, they should be trying to, like I was lucky when, when I fell into coaching because I retired, I studied, I went over to professional football for a year and then, Anthony Foley rang me and I went straight back into the Munster setup. But that's, that is the exception to the rule. You look at someone like Dennis Leamy now, who retired, um, you know, he would have started coaching, would be a really knowledgeable coach. And he was coaching like Cashel and Rockwell and, uh, you know, working around with, 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 with those clubs. But once they get into the professional game, how does he get into the professional game? He can't. So now he's, Leo Cullen and Leinster have afforded him an opportunity to come in now and he's, he's coaching with Leinster. Mm. But it's very, very hard to get into the professional game. So I know that I was fortunate the way I got into it. But for someone like Billy Holland now, most of those guys, if Billy will come out when he eventually does retire, he, they, sh they should not lose the amount of knowledge that he's built mm. up. Or, like, it's good that John Muldoon is coaching now. Like, you could... Uh, yeah. I'm conscious that we're talking a lot about Munster because that's what we know the best. But say John Muldoon stepped out, yeah. he's now coaching over in Bristol, hopefully he'll come back and he'll contribute to Connacht. Mm. Um, but Billy Holland will get a job and he'll get a job doing something. He, he's an intelligent guy and he'll probably want to keep, keep in touch with rugby. So he might go out and he might do, he might end up working with Con and he'll get a, you know, he might, you know, he might get a couple of bob for working with Con. But when he gets under, the pr under pressure at work, the first thing that will have to get dropped, he won't, when people ask him what he does, he won't say I'm a professional rugby coach. He'll say I'm an engineer or something like that. Mm. And I do some work with Cork Con. I really enjoy it. Mm. But when he gets under the pump then, he'll have to, it's the, it's the rugby that will get that will get that will suffer. He'll have to, that'll be the first thing he'll have to drop because he has to focus on his bread and butter. Where if he came out and Christians and Dolphin came together and said, "Billy, we want you to be the full time director of rugby," and then Billy turns around and says, "Okay, I will." So then he's running the he's running the full time program in Christians, and he's also you know the head coach or director of rugby in Dolphin, and he's going in then and he's sitting with Johan van Gran and he's sitting with Stephen Larkham and Graham Rowntree, shadowing them. He come back, implements some of that, and then he's monitoring all these players in inside in Christians, and he's 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 upskilling them and making sure that they're getting the the cutting edge of what what rugby coaching is, and then Billy eventually will be like, okay, now I want to coach the Irish 20s. And then he might get that job with the Irish 20s as well. And then he might go in then as, a, as a, an academy coach at Munster and work his way up to being the forwards coach at Munster. That is a good pathway, but that doesn't exist currently. Hmm. Now, if you were in Leinster, um, someone like Noel McNamara, and I'm not, I, I know I don't have all of, the, all of the details of his career path, but I know he was in Clongos. And he's obviously very, very sharp on rugby. And I don't think it was a sport he played, but picked up on it. And then he's, he's working his way up through now, through the ranks, coaching the Irish 20s, you know, playing really good brand of rugby. Um, he's gone down to New Zealand to upskill. He's come back. He's going to work, you know, he's working his way up. He's involved with Leinster and the, you know, probably working with their A side. And, and eventually, when Felipe Contacomi goes or someone like that, 
he's going to be okay. a, he's going to be an option there, and he's going to know the landscape of all of the best players in Leinster because he'll have worked with them all. Mm. Hugh Hogan is a guy who's 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 coaching there in Leinster now at the moment. Um, who's who, you know that I don't know I don't know Dan Soper's uh, pathway exactly either up in Ulster the skills coach but when I watch Ulster play and I see how good their handling is yeah. and I think Trimby was saying he, he used to work it, in yeah. one of the schools mm. and now they've brought him in as a dedicated skills coach they like you that is the way that you will by creating more people who identify solely as a professional coach I think that that's how you'll improve the the standard and the pathway in in Ulster in Connacht and in Munster because it's there in Leinster and it is working so well um, but the, politically, it is a, that was going to be. Think of, think of how crazy some of the people are in the clubs that we know in, yeah. in Limerick. How do you get, how do you get, uh, how do you get someone in Bowes to say, listen, you're going to be amal We're not going to amalgamate you, but you're going to come together. Your your feeder school now is going to be Arts Reach. and then someone in Shannon will be like, go out of it. I'm, you know, yeah. It, that, but that's that's how we'll make rugby better. You know what I mean? Mm. I like. If you're sending your son or your daughter to a to a school, the, for, the main thing you're sending them for is to get an education. And most the schools are pretty good at that. But you'd like them to be in a good rugby program as well, you know. And I think that, that that's putting someone, if someone's accountable for something, it gets measured. And then if they're a good person and they have a good work ethic, they'll get, they'll get, they'll figure it out. Hmm. And I think that creating those kind of opportunities, it's just financially, that's it. difficult I mean, to it do. It is. Like, we, it all goes back to money. And yeah. I'm sure we're not the first people to point this out and say this is it's been going on a long time. Even when I was playing, it was there was talks about why why the schools and clubs aren't uh, aren't being I suppose looked after by Munster. Um, but it's it's yeah. it's money. It's financially they can't. I'm ca you see when I was on the other side when I was in Munster and I have all the schools and clubs complaining all the time. Yeah. I suppose you're so <coughs> you're so <coughs> under the pump. With trying to get results all the time that you're like what do you want us to do man like i suppose like i was like my job was to coach the forwards and try and do mm. my best at that um but it's it, provide provide coaches it's it, i mean everything yeah. you said there just makes perfect sense it it? create a pathway yeah. for indigenous coaches yeah and i think that like when I, I get like some of my mates that coach underage now like they're really really into it i know that like um you know you get Paul O'Connell will go down to UL Bowes um, and because his because his brother Justin is involved down there, and Les Hogan will work with them, and and you you get things you know. I took some of the some of the Bowes. My mate my mate Les was coaching Bowes under tens a couple of years ago, and he was there to me. He's there, listen, and he'd be so into it. We go for a walk, and even he'd be like, "I'm just trying to work on their handling and trying to get their transfer time shorter." And I'm like, "This is like, you know, sometimes when you're coaching for a living." You are, it becomes a job a little bit, you know. Mm. But then when you see someone who's doing it and how passionate they are about it, I go, "Just this is pretty cool." And he goes, "He goes, if I bring the under tens into the Munster gym someday, um, or up to that training centre, will you bring him in?" And I said, "Oh well, I, I don't think I'm supposed to do this, but I was like, okay, it would probably be eight or nine, ten young fellas there. I'll yeah. take him on a little tour of the training centre and say, like, if you keep working hard, this is where you could end up." When I went down to the front door. There was like I would say every 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 child that had ever played rugby in bowls was there, <laughs> and all of their parents, their grandparents, they're like it was crazy. There was I was like oh shit man I'm gonna lose my job. But I brought them on a little tour of it, yeah. and uh, when we got to I I brought them through the training center or through through the training center, showed them where they get changed, and I said this is where Connor Murray sits, and you know if you keep working on your handling and get your passing real crisp, you could be you could be there where Connor Murray's sitting. I worked my way up and then we got up to the gym and Paul O'Connell's nephew, Justin's son, Ben O'Connell, was there and we were in the gym and I said, Look, and this is where, you know, Dave Kilcoyne is always bench pressing and, and they're like, Ben, get up there. And ben jumps up and does 12 pull-ups, man. <laughs> he ten. He's, He's ten. ten. He's ten. He does 12 full pull-ups. They've got a chin-up bar at home, man. I was like, oh my, this is good. This is great. Like, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but it's, it's, you know, like like ju do. like Justin I would be Justin chin ups now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Justin would be really would be a really sharp guy who loves his rugby. He would have the benefit of having his brother Paul there. Yeah, but and you'll get a lot of people like that, but they may not have the same access to the resources that 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 Justin would have. Justin would have a very good rugby knowledge. He'd also have Paul as his brother there, and mm. then he'd be able to like 
you know, they'd be like I think Johan's son trains down in Bose as well. So like Johan is down there. Like that that's that's how you get access to that kind of mm. upskilling of coaching. But it's it's for all the people that are out there that really want their kids to enjoy rugby. The more you can give them, the more you can, the more, the more tools you give to those coaches, the better yeah. the players will be. Yeah. But I think that, like you're right, a lot of it will come down to finances and politically it's difficult. But shit, like if you want to see how it works, yeah. look at how it's look working at, in look Leinster. Leinster. And with uh, Andy Farrell naming a 37 man panel, is it on Wednesday for the Six Nations? Yeah, if you're on 37, 38. Yeah. 37, 38. Uh, you'd, you'd imagine large bulk of those uh, would be Leinster and his first 15 to start in that Scottish game. Uh, I don't know, it's becoming... I mean, where where do Munster players fit into that? I mean, Max Deegan now raises his hand to potentially start. Um, was it last week? I was like, Caelan Doris has to play international rugby. <laughs> you say the same through with Max Deegan now. Yeah, man. yeah. Like, it's it's going to be really, really interesting. Um, Ruddock even playing. Yeah. Unbelievable. Ruddock. No, I think, yeah, the balance that... that it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a really, really interesting squad. It's going to be really interesting to see what... what what squad he puts out for that Scottish game yeah. and the balance that he goes for in his back three, the balance he goes for with his, you know, if Johnny is back, will he, Johnny will start at 10. Who's he going to go for at nine? Who's, who's what the makeup of the back row is going to be? Um, Tyg Burns injured now. So who, who are the locks? You'd imagine at the moment, the locks would be Ryan and Henderson. Mm. Um, <sighs> Furlong is probably nailed in there at tight head. Maybe with Porter in behind him. Um, Hooker Hooker's really up in the air I, I still think Niall Scanlon is probably there just because Leinster are rotating so much between Tracy yeah. Kelleher Cronin um, Cronin wasn't included in the, the 45 man squad because he was injured yeah yeah. Um, but he's playing unbelievable like, I know he came off the bench again at the weekend but um, can't be ruled out either I mean no he's, no. he's kind of been since Kelleher has come on board he's been Pushed aside a little bit, and people. No, I think he was, in, he was injured. Man. He was, yeah, but yeah, I, th yeah. I think in people's thoughts, everyone's like, "Right now, we have our, 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 our winner. It's it's Keller. We put all invest mm. our, our money in him." But it's, I wouldn't be, be writing Sean Cronin off, um, either. And then, as you said, sixth and center wise, you're probably talking, Aki and Henshaw. Um, yeah, Aki. Oh, no, Ring Rose. You said Ring Rose out. Man. Ring Rose has been unbelievable. Um, Back three is going to be like it's it's between Conway and Earls, you know. Um, has Conway done enough maybe to to push himself in there? Stockdale and and Larmer. Conway has definitely been form on yeah. form. He's you you mentioned Dave Carney at the start yeah. of the show. You can't discount him either. Uh, I, that's why I'm saying I I really don't, don't have I really don't know. That's yeah. why that's why Andy Farrell is the head man as he makes those calls. Yeah. Uh, Cooney again scoring an early try um, you know I mean I thought Murray played brilliantly uh, at the weekend to be honest but uh, mm. but look it's it's that decision obviously we've gone through that a lot um, Ulster look they, they do need to win against Bath to I suppose to to nail down that they'll qualify but it is pretty pretty guaranteed I think to, mm. to qualify Kutsia was incredible again at the weekend mm. the difference the fact they didn't have him when they played Munster and they were so dominant yeah he 19, 19 carries 10 tackles yeah, he got massive momentum man. Yeah. when he carries the ball like he's like a yeah just drops his shoulder like, just yeah. like bouncing off people yeah how good was Camille Shat? Well, I was literally <laughs> I was sitting beside my old fella uh, watching the game uh, I was in in the pub and uh Camille Shat, Shat came on this neck <laughs> like this eh. and I was there this guy is seriously powerful yeah. and they all they, 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 they heard me say it and they were like this they're like he's only got two legs he's only got two legs <laughs> and I was there what the fuck man you know what I mean like I know he's only got two legs and next yeah. when he carried the ball he went bing 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 like through a load of lads he's, um, yeah, he's so I thought powerful. their replacement hooker was really good as well yeah yeah um, well, Donna Ryan was on to me about about working with one of their one of their hookers, uh, I think it was a summer or two ago, about or, or, or at some stage during the season, he said, "Would would you mind doing some some throwing with uh, one uh, one of the young hookers there in in 
in Rasting. He said he's a really good guy. I don't know whether it's this guy Teddy. I think it might have been him, but he was really impressive when he came on. So mm. um, he didn't do it. Uh, I think there was something like there was that they, they couldn't come over himself, and he was going to come over with Donica. And Donica said he's a really good guy. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the fact that Donica Ryan didn't feature was also a massive bonus for Munster. Dominic Bird was missed four or five tackles in the game. Mm. Munster missed forty three tackles in the game. Jesus. Yeah, it's a lot. It it's is. a lot. Now, the one thing is, it's it's a lot more difficult to defend on four G, because yeah. the, on a, on a on a grass pitch when you're when you're running with the ball, mm -hmm. there's a certain amount on the grass pitch, a certain amount of the momentum when you're putting your foot into the ground, the power is being dissipated through the turf. But on four G, it just comes back up just and just brilliant. propels you forward faster. Yeah. So it's harder it's harder to defend. So when you're playing on four G, you want to have the ball. Yeah. Um, but I was. I was impressed with, with Rassing's accuracy. Yeah. Their handling was really, really sharp. Yeah. Ridiculously sharp. Mm. And um, as you said, Fakatoa, I think. Uh, we didn't even mention Iribrim. <laughs> the pass. The pass. It's <laughs> like, they were like, well, what did you make your man's pass? I said, that's the kind of thing when I'd see guys messing before training. I'd be like, stop throwing those, <laughs> stop throwing those stupid passes, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, work yeah, on yeah. your breakdown, work on your clean outs, work on your tackling. Yeah. And it was insane. And it was insane. He was brilliant. And then yeah. Machino was brilliant as well when he yeah, came on. Come on, yeah. It was uh, like for them to be able to to have to have him on the bench and Munster had Craig Casey who who don't think he'd ever played in Europe. Before, yeah. You know, and I know he has to start somewhere, and Craig will be brilliant. Mm. But it just gives you an idea. Of the, and, I, and like that's why I think to be still ahead in the seventy second minute, uh, being under that much pressure is. Impressive, like yeah, it is, it is, you but know? it's it was disappointing it's like saying, to, to leak those last two tries and, and for them to jump to, to 39 points. The but. margins are always incredibly fine, yeah, yeah, incredibly fine. Like when we got to, like I said last year, I reckon if if Simmons, the extra number eight, had not done his ACL at the start of the year, I don't know, would we have beaten Exeter? Okay, yeah, um, if Billy Holland hadn't stolen that line out, we wouldn't have gone through, yeah, the year before. We got through, but like if if Conway hadn't scored that that free try against Toulon, we wouldn't have gotten to the semis. You mm -hmm. know, like it's the margins are so fine, and people don't seem to respect that. They kind of just they get annoyed at Munster for oh, why didn't you get to the final? I'm like, do you, do you think the team is 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 is, is going? You know, mm. is is performing maximally mm. to well, get to I the semi final? The pressure now. is is off now. Essentially, if they don't get to the to the quarterfinals, um, you know after next weekend that they like the reason they're dropping those balls and that they're not uh, I suppose I'm going to get my pen back <laughs> really through that <laughs> offload um, is that now it gives them the time to maybe to do what Dan McFarlane has done um, and change the philosophy of how they play and, and do it with less pressure because having to go into a quarter final and potentially a semi final they're, they're going to be under serious pump to do that and to, to maybe uh, I don't know, play a tighter game. Whereas now, for the rest of the season, obviously they need to to win the Pro Fourteen, or, or mm. they'll, they'll want to win it, and they'll need to to qualify for Europe. But um, I would love to see them expand their their game plan and 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 take the shackles off a bit. Yeah, well, looking at what what like Ulster, Ulster were like Ulster were going down, down, down there. Like had like all the shit that happened them off the field, and then. Every, you know, and then the fact that they were performing poorly as well, um, they hit like rock bottom. And then Dan came in, and it took a while, but they've built and they've built, and now and now they're on the, an upward curve. But mm -hmm. you've got to, you've got to almost go like, this is it, this is where we are. This is realistically where we are. I don't think Munster are in that position at all. No, but that's just, this just is their opportunity to do it. You know, you see what the, I mean. You, Dan I, hasn't I Dan hasn't brought in a huge amount of players to to. Uh, to get us to where they are, he's because uh, he was there. He's brought in Will Addison, um, Fadez. Has he added it? You, but he's he's taken that group of players. Marty Moore, and uh, yes, yeah, Eric, Eric O'Sullivan, um, Jack McGrath, Jack McGrath. <coughs> but I mean, it's it's. I, I understand what yeah. what I'm saying is that Ulster were Ulster were miles off the pace, mm. in my opinion. I don't think Munster are miles off the pace. They just haven't. They just they didn't qualify for Europe. And they had a tough, they had a tough group, and when you lose someone like they're like if if 
if Racing didn't have Finn Russell yesterday, mm. like they probably would have had Trinduk in there or something mm. like that. But you know that would have been a big change for them. Like Munster didn't have Joey in there, who's yeah. probably who's probably there. If if Racing didn't have Fakatawa, it would have been a different game. Yeah, yeah, that's Fact. fair. Yeah. Um, so I don't think Munster are like I don't think Munster are at a rock bottom. They're, no, they're certainly, certainly not. not. They can. They, I think they have a really good chance of going on to win the league. I think that. Um, I think they'll they'll double down their efforts now, and I, I'm not sure what you're saying about like saying, like if they believed in their game plan at the start of the year, there's no reason to say just because they didn't qualify in Europe. Well, right, let's get rid of that game plan now because if you're think if you're the coaches, the coaches come in on Monday morning now and they sit there and they go, I'm 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 presuming that Munster are out of Europe. They go, we're out of Europe. Our game plan is wrong. Let's rip it up and do a new, and start a new one mid season. I'm not sure that that will work. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I can't. I, I would hate to think that Munster would have a game plan that would not involve uh, being able to throw those sweep passes accurately uh, ten to fifteen times a game and. And be a threat in attack more than one or two passes. You well, know that's that's the level they need to get to, and it's that's proven by how the teams that are winning every competition and winning these quarters and semi-finals that their ability to play, like you said, like Finn Russell can do anything. Mm. Um, this is what I think, in my opinion, is where the next step. And and you know these players, I suppose the monster. Uh, Philosophy has always been play ten man rugby or or from the outside. Yeah, it doesn't in work or, anymore. Man, it yeah. doesn't. Yeah, and uh, we need to just push it aside and and move on. And, but, and I, but Rob if, Penny, when he was brought in, he probably went too far trying to bring it from side to side and bringing that Crusaders mm. uh, game plan. And but it was it was very expensive. But the players became better players in that twelve months. There was no doubt about it. You saw players handling the ball uh, twice as much, if not more, than they would than than they would yeah. in a normal game. Um, so it's it's very doable, and Ulster are a prime example, and Connacht were a prime example of it when they when they did it a few years ago, and it's and Glasgow have done it, and it's it's uh, I would I would just it would excite me to think that Munster could take, and I think the players would would respond well to it, could take that attitude and and uh, you know play a little bit more rugby. I agree with you, but like I, I if you're setting up sweet passes, and the players don't execute them. Mm. What's, yeah. what, so, what's 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 the point there? Yeah. Like, what, is it is that on the players? Is that is that mm. like my my point was that like I felt that by saying that Stephen Larkin has come in and that you know it'll take the players time to get used to him, I was like, but a play, me passing the ball to you with Pat McCarry as the coach or with Eddie Cameron. Jones as the coach, yeah. I still have to pass the ball too. If I pass it over your head or throw it behind you, mm. like it just because. I've changed coaches. I mean, I forgot how to pass. Yeah. You know, so like that's, I was just, my, my point was like, you can't use the fact that you've changed coaches as, an, as a crutch or as an excuse for players when they just don't do basics well. Mm -hmm. And the players just need to, just need to pick up on those things. You know, like they're, they are very, very good players. I don't think Munster are at rock bottom. Um, I think that they are, they had an incredibly hard group. So from the start of the year, you go, this is going to be hard. Every year, you kind of go, this is going to be really tough to get out of our group. So when we get out of our group and get any, any way in the competition, if you get to the semi-finals, you're one of the top four teams in Europe. That's amazing. You know yeah. what I mean? Uh, it's just understanding how difficult it is to actually get there. Now, they haven't gotten there this year. Let's presume they haven't gotten there this year. They still have the nucleus of a very strong squad there. Maybe, maybe they do need to tweak their game plan. I don't know. Yeah. But okay. it, the weekend was obviously not good enough. Yeah, the effort was excellent, but the accuracy. Yeah, well, enough. still doable next weekend uh, against the Ospreys in Thome Park. Uh, Connacht, uh, we better touch on them before we move on. In a similar situation, out of the Champions Cup now, um, potentially not as strong squad depth as well. Did you see any positives from that loss against Toulouse? Ah, uh, positives. It's it was uh, the fact that it was twenty one seven. Yeah. Um, but like. Toulouse ended up with 13 players at the end of the game. But like, like we said at the very start, it's like you said, squad depth. They're losing when they, they, they've had injuries. They, I think they had to start Curran's uh, ahead of Blade. I think 
that could be his first European start, is it? Yeah. I think mm, it's yeah. his first European start because Blade is playing non-stop, man. Mm. And um, they, they, they just... They just got. They just couldn't. Ma they couldn't handle the Toulouse power. Now Toulouse, I thought, were really impressive, not just because their, you know, their their carriers were offloading all the time and using a bit of footwork on the gain line. They were clever with the way they played, um, and then when it when push came to shove, and Toulouse emptied their bench, bring on Rory Arnold, Movaka, Bezzi, You know, they'd Entomac, they'd Huge, mm. and then they went down to thirteen players. With, with Zach Holmes getting sent off and, and Hugh's yellow card and still Connacht couldn't break him down. Now, I, I thought, look, I thought Connacht started, I thought Toulouse started well and then Connacht got right back in the mix. Adi Loken, if he'd gotten that try mm. um, on, the, on the hack through, I think, I think that could have been a, a, a big turning point, but they still went ahead. Um, their, mall, their mall has been decent this year. What was the update on Connor Fitzgerald's injury? Is that, is that long term? No, I don't think he's out long term, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know whether he'll be back in time for next week. Yeah, I think, I think Jack Carty, he, he needs a, a run of games for Connacht. I think he came out during the week and said his confidence was down, his energy was down after the World Cup. Um, needs a bit of time. Hopefully he can get uh, Tom Farrell back. Um, I think he's a, he's a very important player for them. Alton Delan did come off injured, but uh, playing very well. I'd, I'd, I would think he might be... Uh, might be included in Andy Farrell's. They, what Connacht, Connacht what? need is is big ball carriers in their in their pack mm. because of the way they play. They need someone that's, that can just carry the ball, get get them on the front foot, and then they're all running onto the ball injecting because they're, they're you can see they're well 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 drilled, well coached in terms of shape, but they rely heavily on the shape. And if they don't get momentum, then it's just really they're all they all drop back into their shape, and then the ball goes out to their back line, and the opposition defense is just running onto them. Yeah, um, I thought like I thought they got outworked. I thought they got outworked in that. Looking at it, Toulouse's front five had sixty five carries. Connacht had thirty five. Mm. Now Connacht don't don't play around the corner, so they won't have as many carries. But even in the back row, Toulouse had like forty carries versus eighteen from Connacht. Mm. So you know it's just it's it's attritional that when the opposition are holding the ball and it's that hard to stop them and they weren't just mutant ball carriers, they're mutant ball carriers with skill and then they just emptied their bench and at the end, the, con the fact that Connor couldn't break them down was, mm. was disappointing. But again, finances. Um, yeah. But it goes Fight, back to our point. Link to move to, to Leon as well next year, which would be a disaster for them. Yeah. Uh, definitely one of their best players. But mm. sorry, go back to your point. It goes back to the point around... You don't want to have to compete with the French clubs financially at senior level. Mm. You know what I mean? You don't want to have to say, okay, well, where are we now as a team at the end of the year, wash up with Connacht and go, listen, we need to come up with another 2.4 million to sign five more players. You know, that, that's not where you're, if you took that money and invested it over, over five years, that 2.4, 2. whatever million, invested that into the schools and clubs, you just see how much, like how much you get out of it when you yeah. look at the Leinster model, yeah. and then it means that you you invest that money over five years rather than one year, mm -hmm. and then you just keep reaping the rewards from it. Summing Amen. it up, I don't know. Amen. Yeah, I agree. All right, we'll take a, a quick break, and we'll come back in a minute with black and white. All right, welcome back, and it's time for black and white. For this week's black and white, we're gonna do. The best 15 funniest lads we've played with. Uh, so it's like a comedy 15. Yes. Right. Who's the best crack? The best crack. 15, the best C-bombs out there. Um, okay, I'm going to let you go first. Then I might steal some of yours. Um, okay. So crack, are we talking like to laugh at, to laugh with, that good at making jokes? Uh, just general. I just lads who were just good in the squad, funny. So okay. I started. I went Kilcoyne at Loosehead. Ah. Um, for for just he's just fucking hilarious maniac. He's yeah. just hilarious. Um, at Hooker, I had a lot of competition. A funny position. Funny position. So John Fogarty, hilarious. Yeah. Dennis Fogarty. Yeah. Same cloth. Uh, Sean Cronin. Mm -hmm. uh, Bernard Jackman. Mm -hmm. Uh, Frankie Sheehan, all very funny, but I went with Dennis Foggs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tight heads. That laugh, a very infectious laugh. Yes. 
mm-hmm. not an awful lot of very funny tight heads. Mm-hmm. So I went with maybe a little bit racist. I went with Freddie Pucciarello because of his because he's foreign and probably not was his grasp of English wasn't great. Yes, but that led to an awful lot of funny shit that he said then. Correct. Um, and then I went in the row. I remember. I, went, I remember Fetty. We were playing that game. Uh, we were on a drinking uh, uh, a session, a bit of a party, whatever. And we were playing that drinking game where you lay all the cards out in a circle. It's called Circle of Death. Circle of Death. Yeah. So, Pat, you, you lay the cards out in a circle face down <laughs> and then you pick up a card and it, each one has a different meaning. Mm. And there's a pint glass in the middle and you fill it and the, the last one to pick up a king downs it. And there's a one in it where you have to make a rhyme and uh, oh, yeah. you're playing with Fetty and his grasp of English is flat. It was so poor uh, that he's, he's taken this game was just all over the shop. But the make a rhyme is like a rap or something. So you go like rat, uh, cat, fat, <laughs> class rap, sat, or whatever. <laughs> Spitting bars there, Barry. <laughs> yeah. Folks, uh, rhyme. You're a musician, a rhyme. Man. You're a musician. <laughs> and uh, it got to, to Fetty. It was like, we're trying to explain it to him. So we're like, so fat, rat, cat and then it's like sounds like so you have to do like sounds like that so so cat so now you're up and he was like oh okay meow <laughs> <laughs> i don't know and then he picked that card next and he had to do one that we all had to to rhyme with <laughs> and he goes aeroplane <laughs> <laughs> how the fuck do you rhyme Fuck's with that sake. um second rows i went donica callahan yeah because he's a funny bastard and then Next second row, I had Malo Kelly, but I also put like Tom Bowman in there as well. Do you remember Big oh, yeah. Tom Bowman? Yeah. The Australian. Yeah. Just because it was like training every day for Tom Bowman was a laugh because he didn't give a shit. Yeah. And then because Alan Gaffney was coaching us, we were all a bit afraid of him at the time. We were like, oh my God, he doesn't give a shit what Alan Gaffney says to him. like yeah. Smoking darts and um, arson around. Blindside flanker, I went Alan Quinlan. Because he's very, very funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wally, because he's Wally yeah. at seven. Funniest man alive. At eight, at eight, I, I was stuck. I went from the professional side, I went Stephen Kyo. <laughs> but yeah. I really want to put Davy Quinlan in there from Shannon because he's so funny as well. Yeah. Um, when we're on... So who'd you go with? I'm gonna Davey. go. I'm going to go with... What I might do is I might just drop Wally and put Davy in at seven. Okay. Uh, nine. What, were you going to say something funny about Davy there? No, I just, whenever you go on a stag, he's always like literally the funniest guy ever on a stag. Yeah. And I was like, man, you should just do this for a living, man. Just go on stags professionally and just follow them around. I ended up people. crashing his stag in Vegas. He got married in Vegas and I was out there on a holiday and I'd never met him before. And Mossy and Quinny were on it and they were like, oh, give me a shout and they're like we're over here in a stag do you want to join us and uh, yeah we've, we fell madly in love for that yeah. 24 hours he's hilarious uh, I went Tomas O'Leary at 9 yep 10 I went with Conrad O'Sullivan oh yeah Conrad not always a 10 but <clears throat> absolutely shout. funniest man ever yeah. um, going through left wing I went Trimby uh, surprisingly people think he's no crack but he's, I'm still getting that man people are in the public <laughs> Trimble is actually very, very funny, you know? I thought he was like just it. very religious. And I, was like, yeah, I know, I know, fucking hell. Um, 12, 12 was difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, I went with Jimmy Dox, James Dorn, <laughs> Munchins Was he a 12? Challenge. I thought he was a 7. He's a Doesn't 7, matter. he's playing 12 now for <laughs> us. Uh, he should be lucky to get in this, he, he's lucky to get in this team, man, because of the, the quality, but he's, he's very, very funny. Yeah. 13, I went with Barry Murphy because you're here. Yeah. Um, and on the on the right wing, right wing, I went Fergus McFadden. And then I got stuck because there are no funny full backs. <laughs> there is no... They so don't exist. I, and, stru- I, I literally could not Let's go find through them. them. Uh, start from the very start. Dominic Crotty, great guy. Yeah. Not funny. Nope. Gervin Dempsey, great guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not funny. Not funny. Uh, Sean Payne Sean Payne yep. great guy not funny yep. Rob Kearney brilliant under the high ball <laughs> not funny <laughs> Gavin Duffy yes great guy wow they're very similar Pin. people not funny yeah 
Felix Jones. <laughs> intense. <laughs> Sometimes he can be funny, but yeah. too intense. Too much of a nerd. Uh, I'm struggling, man. Yeah. I'm really struggling. I can't. I literally don't have a 15. I put Wally 15 as my captain. Just cause, David Wallace. Yeah, just because there is so... There's such a, a gap of at 15 that I needed something outrageous so, and I wanted him to be captain as well because he's... That's kind of a little bit of bollocks, man. You just put, you just put a, a back row at... at he played back. in the fucking centre for Munster. <laughs> so. He played in the wing. He played in, Oh, he did, okay. He played okay. in the wing. Yeah. Wally was... Or Liam, he was the centre. Okay, Sticking go on. Give me back. your 15. Uh, I went with Fetty as well uh, in the front row. I went with Dennis Foggs. Sorry, I didn't know we had to mention each other. I left you out. Yeah, fuck. You'd, I don't you'd, want to mean You'd be in there. Uh, Ronnie McCormick, who played for Leinster, I put him in uh, because... He, he, I felt like he was always trying to take advantage of me anytime I played with him, like uh, financially. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Like, Jay Baz, do you want to play an old game of poker? I don't know how to play poker. It's grand. Sit in there. You know, he was like a hilarious man. But uh, yeah, very old school. I went with Dunners. I went with O'Connell. O'Connell makes me laugh a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ken O'Connell, I put I think, in at I six. Think, I, think, I think the O'Connell is the same as Felix. They're funny, but the intensity... The yeah. intensity kind of overspills a little bit. Yeah, but very silly at the same mm. time. Um, I went with Ken O'Connell, uh, former Munster in Ireland. Great call. Put him in at six. I love the story about him playing for Ireland against France and uh, in Paris, and they were hammered, and Richard Harris came into the dressing room after the game, and uh, they got to know each other in, and went on the piss. And Ken ended up staying with Richard Harris for three days in Paris. What? <laughs> Missed the flight home, got dropped the following week. Uh, yeah, just went on a bit of a bender with him. As you'd have to do if it was Richard Harris, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Ken, straight in there. Went with Niall Ronan at seven. Uh, oh, hilarious fuck. man. Yeah, that would have yeah. been a good one. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Just constant gags. I went with Garrett Noonan, made of mine, who was our number eight in school. Played for Shannon, won many, won many AALs with Shannon. Uh, hilarious man, gets himself into awful uh, situations. I went with Prendy, Mike Prendergast at, at Scrum Half. Um, just a different, different type of funny. Yeah. And also a brilliant attack coach. No. Yeah. Uh, I put stuck Tomas in out half because I struggled with out halves as well. Mm -hmm. uh, similar to fullbacks. Uh, so Tomas has played a little bit of ten, so you can go in there. Went with uh, Rob Henderson at twelve. Um, yes. Who was a hilarious man. I went with Mike Mullins at thirteen. Because uh, he did, he was the one of the, like, not a funny fella, really, but he did the most hilarious thing I've ever seen, where uh, in Thoman Park, when he was doing his going away uh, goodbye to the audience, who were like thousands of people on the pitch after a game, they gave him the microphone to say goodbye, and they, everyone told him to sing, and he sang. Creep by ra <laughs> <laughs> creep by Radiohead. It's so weird. To ten thousand people. <laughs> it's on YouTube, man. You should anyone that watched look this up. It was the most bizarre but hilarious moment. I don't know if he did it trying to be funny. I picked Keith Earls in the wing because uh, everything that comes out of his mouth is hilarious. Trimby on the other wing, and Wally captain fullback. You cheated at fifteen, but at least you got a fifteen. I only got fourteen. We could just leave them out. Just to retire the jersey. That's no crack. We've got to try and find a funny... I wonder if Jordan or more or Stockdale, are they funny? Addison is funny. Oh. Straight in there, Will. Sorry. We'll have them, so... Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. All right, that's a great one. Enjoyed that. Uh, anyone get want to get in touch and tell us their uh, hilarious 15? Doesn't matter if they're... We've never heard of them. Just stick them in. Any funny stories, let us know. Trimby has now lit the Facebook page up. So um, Trimby will keep uh, keep on that. So so get in touch there as well. Uh, cheers to everybody for listening and for those watching on YouTube. That was a really enjoyable show. Uh, to everyone that helped organise the show today, to Alan, to Dermot, to Anthony and to Pat, thanks a million. This has been Baz and Andrew's House of Rugby here on Joe together with Guinness. We'll be back next week with Jerry and myself and Trimby. Party on.